Hey everyone, today we are in Wichita Falls, Texas at the Riverside Cemetery and I have a story on a couple old outlaws from the Old West that I thought you might find interesting. Let me show you who we're talking about. As you're in the cemetery, you can see a little bit of reference from the landscape. There's the water tower over there. That large monument to the right of the tree, almost sort of underneath, is Kemp. And then right here is another tree. This is on the back side of the cemetery and there's a bird feeder right there. So someone's been visiting. But here we have Bill Crawford and Elmer Lewis. February 27th, 1896. So this marker has broken off and someone has kind of leaned it up against this turtle there. And then there's a sunflower next to it. Our story begins on February 25th, 1896, when a couple of outlaws, William, Bill, as he was better known, Crawford, and Elmer Lewis, decided to rob the City National Bank in Wichita Falls, Texas. As they entered the bank, P. Langford was concentrating on a line of figures doing some bookkeeping. Crawford approached him and commanded, Up! Up! But Langford didn't realize what was happening, so Crawford cracked him on the top of the head with his pistol. It accidentally discharged into the ceiling of the bank. That shot kicked off both bandits shooting. It is thought that Lewis shot Frank Dorsey, who was going for his pistol at the time. Now, the interesting thing about Frank Dorsey is he had a premonition that he was going to get killed in the bank. In fact, he went to J.A. Kemp, who was the president of the bank, and tried to turn in his resignation. Mr. Kemp talked him into staying. He also had told his wife that he thought that this was going to happen, and this was all about three months prior to this actual event happening. They both told him it was nothing and talked him into staying. However, he kept having these nightmares and thinking that they were so realistic that they would actually happen. On February 25th, 1896, he had another premonition that morning that it would actually happen. His wife told him it was nothing than it was his imagination, as did the president, and talked him into staying once again. That's when the bank robbery actually happened and he was shot and killed. So just to give you a little bit of reference, there's those buildings off in the distance. And Susan Palmer is right there, the sister of Frank and Jesse James. You might have seen a video that I've done on that. But we're looking for Frank Dorsey. January 5th, 1862 to February 25th, 1896. Dr. O.J. Kendall, a prominent physician and vice president and director of the bank, was then shot. Kendall was unarmed, but the bandits aimed for the heart and didn't miss. But what they didn't know is that Kendall was carrying his metal hypodermic case and it happened to be in the vest pocket and it deflected the bullet and spared his life. However, Kendall did fall to the floor and played dead. The bookkeeper, Langford, partially recovered and staggered to his feet. He jumped over the counter and headed for the door. The bandits fired three shots at him. Two of them missed, but one hit him in the buttocks. He still managed to get out the door and yell, Robbers! In total, the bandits didn't get much. They only got $416. They failed to open the unlocked door to the vault, and they had to rush out of the bank because of the clamor that was growing outside in the streets. They rushed out the back door, pushing an unarmed city marshal, J.D. Davis, out of the way. Deputy Sheriff Frank Hardesty arrived and shots were exchanged. Crawford shot Hardesty, but the shot hit his round pocket watch in Hardesty's pants, so it had no effect on him at all. But it is thought that Hardesty fired back at Kid Lewis, and he wasn't hit, but his horse was fatally wounded. <laughs> Now, after Lewis's horse had been shot, he immediately dismounted. Crawford waited for Lewis to hop on the back of the horse, and the two of them rode away out of town with the money. 
Immediately, the townsfolk decided to form a posse and go after the two bandits, but they were unsuccessful in locating them. But one of the townsfolk sent a telegraph to Captain McDonald of the Texas Rangers, who had gotten on a train and left Wichita Falls earlier that day. You see, the Texas Rangers had been in town to guard the banks because word had come out of Indian Territory that one of the banks was going to be robbed, and the townsfolk had seen a number of outlaws camping outside of Wichita Falls, and they were notorious outlaws. It's unsure as to whether or not Crawford or Lewis were some of those outlaws or not. But immediately when the Texas Rangers left, that's when the bank got robbed. So the horses were readied, and Captain McDonald came back into Wichita Falls, took off with his rangers, and then some of the posse that was formed, and they tried to locate the bandits. In the meantime, Crawford and Lewis, the horse that they were on, obviously is going to wear out because it's trying to carry two people and they couldn't go too far. So they took two plow horses that were large and big. These couldn't go very far, very fast. They had already been worked, so they got worn out. The two outlaws dismounted and they hid in a thicket. Now the townsfolk that had formed part of the posse found the outlaws, but they didn't want to flush them out. The rangers, however, did flush them out of the thicket. What they did offer, though, is that they offered the outlaws safety and protection from the posse of the town. See, the townsfolk were mad, and the outlaws knew it. So they offered them protection, and they took the outlaws into custody and took them back into jail in Wichita Falls. So Captain McDonald escorted the two outlaws back to Wichita Falls. He immediately could tell that the townsfolk were upset and in an uproar and they wanted instant justice. Captain McDonald tried his best to calm down the townsfolk and eventually he felt that the town was calm enough that he could leave town and leave the two outlaws in the jail and let the town sort it out. He had other business to tend to, so he was off on his way. Meanwhile, Frank Dorsey was buried. Now, Frank Dorsey left behind a widow and three children. And, of course, the widow was seen at the funeral at 6 p.m. on February 26, kissing her husband goodbye in the casket. That resonated with the people and got them upset, and by 8.45... On February 26, the townsfolk started growing and protesting. They lit a bonfire on the corner of the City National Bank. They started saying chants of, Did you see the missus kiss her mister goodbye and the children crying beside his casket and his grave? Eventually, the townsfolk grew to 350 and soon 500. They then marched their way down to the jail, shouting more. Justice for Dorsey, justice for the man that was murdered, and justice for their friend. Eventually, they took a pole and busted down the door of the jail. They broke out the two outlaws and then took them back to the corner of the City National Bank. At that location, they lynched them right on the spot using the telegraph poles that were in front of the City National Bank. Now, Lewis taunted and cursed the crowd with insults, whereas Crawford begged the crowd for whiskey and mercy. But the two outlaws were hanged right there on the spot. February 27th, 1896. Now one outlaw was placed in a casket and the other outlaw was placed in the crate that the casket came in. Both were taken to the cemetery and buried in the same exact grave together they actually put a marker on the grave, believe it or not. Yes, the townsfolk had the right idea to try to give them a Christian burial after all and try to make things right. Now, this town vigilante sparked off a lot of controversy. Of course, the Wichita Falls newspaper was in support of this townsfolk justice against the outlaws. Not only that, the Fort Worth paper was as well. Some of the surrounding states that it had the same problem with outlaws being safeguarded in Indian territory and then coming across the border 
and stealing cattle and robbing banks and then going back across into Indian territory were also in support of what happened in Wichita Falls. But the Dallas Morning News was against what happened, and there also were some other papers and politicians and stuff like that that were against it. However, it did change things, and it did sort of bring justice to the area, and a cry for help that there needed to be more federal protection and federal police inside Indian Territory and the surrounding areas when these criminals exited and tried to harbor themselves within the territory. So we're on the corner of Scott and 8th Street in downtown Wichita Falls, and this is the City National Bank building. It appears that it is still a bank, so I won't be doing too much filming up close. And I guess maybe it's other things up there like apartments or something, but this would have been the location of where that bank robbery would have happened. I did happen to notice a historical marker that's over there underneath the awning, so we'll go over and include a couple photos if I can, maybe even a couple shots of video if we can. I'm not sure. Just didn't want to get too close. I didn't want them thinking that I'm casing the place for a bank robbery myself. So this is the City National Building, 807 8th Street. And this is located underneath the awning. And it says the Wichita Falls Bank Robbery of 1896. On the afternoon of February 25th, 1896, two cowboys, Foster Crawford and Elmer Kid Lewis, robbed the City National Bank then located at Ohio and 7th Street, two blocks east. They killed the cashier, Frank Dorsey, took about $410 cash and fled on horseback. A posse of citizens and Texas Rangers captured the pair that night hiding in a thicket outside of town. The next day after the rangers departed, the anger of the townspeople turned to violence. On the night of February 26, a mob dragged the prisoners from the jail and lynched them in front of the bank building. And this historical marker was placed here in 1978. So we are now located at 7th and Ohio, just like the sign said. And I don't know exactly where that bank building was. Stuff looked like it was here for a while, but quite possibly maybe it was that building right there. Here's what's on this corner. This is a whole intersection. The crosswalk is a piano that way with a bunch of piano keys. And then this way, it's guitars. So the opposite sides of it, it's exactly the same, but quite possibly is it that building right there or was there something else on this corner? Or something else on that corner? And it's always possible that something else could have been here. But either way, 7th and Ohio is where that bank robbery would have taken place. So pretty interesting history right here in Wichita Falls. As I was walking the cemetery, Looking around for the old outlaws, I happened to find another one that was interesting. Right here, it says grandfather at the top, Thomas Curran Hollander, born February 4th, 1860, and died August 18th, 1916. And then at the bottom it says gunned down in Wichita Falls, shot in the back by a coward. So I appreciate you guys tuning in and watching another episode of the Old West. If you liked it, give it a big thumbs up. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time. So I was in the downtown Wichita Falls area, and this building happened to catch my eye. It's so tiny. It's pretty tall, four stories tall. But there's not much to it. It's not very wide or very long or anything. And it's on the back of this uh, building right here where it says re-elect Dave Allred, state representative. But there's a sign here notating that this is the world's littlest skyscraper, 1919. Pretty interesting. It's not big at all. All those little floors look like tiny little bedrooms or what would be bedrooms, offices some sort of business or whatever, but it's some sort of shop now.
It is the hello again shop. Maybe quite possibly at some sort of boutique or something like that. Maybe someone with some research skills could look that up and leave a comment below. But that is tiny.